Welcome back, everyone. Hopefully you're all here. You got some food, got some water. <laughs> that music was hilarious, <laughs> whoever chose that. Um, so at this point, we are going to switch gears and uh, have a lightning round. So we'll have a few of our producer members provide a brief glimpse into their endeavors, uh, their business operations, their land stewardship practices. I'm just giving a little snapshot of their lives. So we have uh, four, Marsha Baranaga, Kelly Dune, Sarah Kaiser, and John Bailey. Um, and so we'll start with Marsha Baranaga of Baranaga Ranch. You here? Okay, perfect. Hi. <laughs> Hello. People hear me? Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm really happy to have this opportunity to tell you a little bit about Baranaga Ranch. And I'm just gonna take a minute to share my screen here. Good. Okay, um, so our ranch is 800 acres on the east shore of Tamales Bay in Marin County. It's protected as farmland forever by a conservation easement from the Marin Agricultural Land Trust. My husband and I bought the ranch in 2001. We have a tenant who raises cattle on about 700 acres of the ranch, and I keep my sheep on about 100 acres. We've got amazing Great Pyrenees dogs to protect our sheep, and we've never had a single loss to predators, even though we hear coyotes every night and we have a resident mountain lion. Um, we're part of the, of the Fiber Shed Climate Beneficial Program, currently transitional, and in addition to rotational grazing, we've created a wildlife-friendly pond area, and we've done multiple plantings of Monterey Cypress windrows for carbon sequestration and also to provide wind and shade shelter for the sheep. Using our tenants cattle, we've also started a project of mob grazing to control invasive velvet grass in some of our sheep pastures. And this year we began a multi-year plan of compost and seed application for carbon sequestration and improved pasture productivity. We were incredibly lucky with our timing this year. Um, this was October 14th and that's the compost spreader. They started at daybreak and worked like mad to get all the compost spread before the first rain of the season started that evening. So now everything is beautiful and germinating and green. My first sheep were East Frisian dairy sheep. They're beautiful, open-faced, really friendly sheep. And uh, we milked them and I made a delicious aged cheese that I sold mostly through Cowgirl Creamery. East Frisians aren't particularly known for their wool, but I was really fortunate early on to meet Jackie Post from Sheep to Shop who makes beautiful felted products. And Jackie discovered that the East Frisian wool was really good for felting. And she's bought most of my East Frisian wool at my shearings ever since. I also had some yarn made a long time ago in the old days of the Yolo County Mill, and it's wonderful for Aaron style sweaters. Heather from Fibershed made this sweater, and here's one I made from the black yarn from my black East Frisians. As much as I loved making cheese, after nine years, the workload was really too much. And so I decided in 2016 to shut the dairy and to go to my true happy place, which is knitting. And so I started to transition my flock to a fiber flock. I bought a founding Romney flock, recessive colored Romneys from Tawanda Farms up in Siskiyou County. And I'm breeding these Romneys from mid to dark gray fleeces that hold their color as the sheep age. I also bought a founding flock of Corydales from Marble Peaks Ranch, also up in Siskiyou County. And they're giving me beautiful fine white and black fleeces. And this past year, we added Perry the Cormo, um, and bred him to our Corydales uh, to give a finer, finer wool in the offspring from those crosses. Now I couldn't part with all my beloved East Frisians, so we did cross them with our um, fiber rams. We bred Dale the Corydale ram to our East Frisian ewes and called those lambs the Freedales. This is Frida the first Freedale, and she's had really gorgeous fleeces that have been very popular with hand spinners. We bred Myth the Romney to our East Frisians and got the Romnesians. This is Melinda who works with me posing with a couple of the Romnesian ewes. They're just as friendly as their East Frisian mothers and they've got those cute Romney hairdos and really nice Romney type fleeces. Now every season on the ranch is really busy so I thought I'd just give you a highlight uh, a couple of highlights from our annual calendar. The rams wait eagerly all year for that great day in September when we put them in with the ewes for breeding. This year we had seven rams, and so that means seven breeding groups with one ram per group, so that I know the father and the pedigree of every lamb born. 
I plan each cross based on genetic traits that I want, including color, fleece characteristics, and breed. Two weeks ago was the end of breeding, and we took the rams out. The ewes got to go straight out to a fresh green pasture, but the boys had to go to jail. Um, we lock our rams in a box stall for a week or so after we take them off the ewes to keep them from fighting, which rams will do by backing up great distances and then charging each other and bashing heads, and they can cause brain damage. Um, so we protect them by locking them in tight quarters while that hormone-fueled aggression calms down a little bit. We also fit them with leather face shields, which block their forward vision and further discourage ramming. The next big event in our calendar is ultrasound day, which comes about 30 days after the rams are taken out when Dr. Dottie, our vet, comes and ultrasounds the ewes. This was really important back in the days of the dairy because dairy sheep tend to have high multiple births and the ultrasound could identify the ewes that were carrying triplets or quads so that we could keep a special eye on them. The fiber sheep aren't nearly as fertile and we don't get triplets and quads so much anymore, but the ultrasound helps us identify the ewes that haven't become pregnant in any given season so we can separate them and put them on a different feeding program. There's just what Dr. Dowdy was seeing on his screen there. Um, in January, about a month before we begin lambing, we shear, and that's so the ewes will be clean from lambing. And it's also because the stress of lambing can cause wool break, and that becomes less of an issue if the ewes have just been shorn. In February, it's time to prepare the lambing barn. We bring the ewes in every night during lambing so that any nighttime births are born in a safe environment. And we also have a surveillance camera in our barn so that we can watch the barn from home and be present for every birth. The lambs spend about their first three days with their mother in a five by five lambing jug to get to know each other before we put mothers and lambs out together in a group. That group comes into the barn at night until the lambs are a week old. And then the mothers and lambs are out full time on pasture protected by our dogs. We wean the lambs in June, and then we're busy all summer, raising lambs, weighing them, vaccinating them, trimming the feet of all of our sheep, which we do three times a year, and coat changing. We do a lot of coat changing. Um, our sheep average about five coat changes per year to accommodate their growing fleeces. It's a lot of work, but it's really worth it for the clean fleeces that we get free of vegetable matter. So the fiber products that we sell from our sheep Include Marshall, raw fleeces for hand Sorry to interrupt you. You got about uh, 60 seconds left, just so you know. Oh, okay. Um, I'll just finish here. Um, raw fleeces for our hand spinners. Um, in the gray from the, from the Romney sheep, white and black from our Corydales. I have roving and I have um, a collection of yarns. And I'll just leave it there. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing all those photos and giving some uh, perspective into your life out there. The names are hilarious. Oh my God, <laughs> <Mitter Romney. laughs> that's excellent. Um, all right, we'll shift to Kelly Dunay of Spring Coyote Ranch and the Rainbow, uh, Rainbow Fiber Co-op. Yeah, oh yeah, there you are. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Kelly. Uh, my ranch name is Spring Coyote Ranch. I'm just gonna go ahead and pull up my PowerPoint. I am not a Zoom pro, so. Okay. Yep, there it is. All right. Oh, shoot. Oh, there we go. Sorry. That's the beginning. Uh, so, this is my ranch. This is my favorite photograph of the ranch. Um, this was taken by Paige Green. She is fabulous and turns up in a lot of fiber shed photography for a reason. Um, this is obviously in the summer season. Um, it's a coastal prairie uh, over Tamales Bay. We raise uh, Navajo churro sheep. You can see their wool blowing in the wind there. Um, I'm just going to give you guys a snapshot about my ranch and project and then kind of dig into the rainbow fiber project more than my ranch because that's the thing that's really exciting that's going on right now for me. Um, we have 150 acres of coastal prairie and riparian. We're about halfway between Point Reyes Station and Tamales on Highway 1. Uh, the Spring Coyote is, is a copper etching that was actually made by a friend of mine named Julia Lucy. Um, and where I know people um, are on Instagram um, with a presence, I try to put their tags in here so you guys can check them out. She's an amazing botanical and natural artist. Um, our ranch has a year-round stream that flows into Tamales Bay. Um, the stream was a gathering site for Coast Miwok people 
and there's a sizable shell mound um, right at the base of our property uh, before the stream drains out into Marconi Cove. Our primary focus is Navajo churro sheep. We also have a small flock of chickens. We have several guard dogs, guard llamas, um, and we recently started a herd of Spanish goats for mobile grazing. It's a project that I'm working on with the neighbor who doesn't have grazing animals um, to help with brush control. That's the first time I've taken on a new species in, in quite a while. I'm, so far, I'm loving it. They're just so easy and, and they just love to climb things and eat brush. Um, so I'm hoping maybe to expand with them next year. Um, but Navajo Churro is really what I spend most of my time um, working on. We are passionate about animal husbandry and land stewardship. Um, I mean, you really have to be obsessed, I think, to keep up with everything. Um, and that fits me perfectly. Life is a constant balance between day-to-day -day task management, also known as chores, um, and our long-range goals, which include everything from the genetic diversity in our herd to the color genetics that we're working with to produce different colors of wool and different styles of sheepskins to our compost application like Marsha just talked about. Um, so there's definitely like, there's a distinct like daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, like a seasonality to your mindset that is baked into kind of everything that you think about and everything that you do every day. Um, it makes it really challenging, even though a lot of the day-to-day -day work is sometimes drudgery, um, but it just keeps you so busy and so engaged that it doesn't really feel like that. Uh, we sell lamb shares direct to customer every fall, and we deliver those uh, lambs personally across the Bay Area, which is pretty fun once a year to just really get close and connect with customers. We also sell breeding stock, wool products, and sheepskins. Um, you can find me on uh, Instagram at Spring Coyote Ranch. A project that I'm helping to coordinate with a dear friend of mine um, named Nikhail Begay. You can find them on uh, Instagram at Navajo Shepherd. Um, it's called Rainbow Fiber Co-op. Um, and this is an exciting new agricultural cooperative dedicated to paying Navajo Shepherds a fair price for their Navajo churro wool. Typically Navajo churro is either rejected at the large wool buys on the Navajo Nation or they're paid a penny a pound, which barely pays for the bags that you would pack the wool in to bring to the buy. Um, so it's been a discouraging situation for years. And then with the COVID pandemic, even those buys were getting canceled, which is, you know, at least it was an outlet, even though the pay was not good. Um, so last year we just started talking and Rebecca um, was guiding us. And, and so we just gradually step-by-step step put this project together. And we're at a pretty exciting point right now. Um, we've raised funds through grants and private donations to execute our first wool buy back in July and August. Um, we also raised the money to pay the mill fees for the wool. That's a huge barrier to entry for shepherds and farmers to get involved in creating their own wool business because you know, on finished product, even a good rate, which, you know, more Valley Spinning Mill is where we're working. They, um, the charge is $21, $22 an hour, which is pretty competitive for wool on a small scale. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty big barrier to entry if you think about what it would cost to start with 3,000 pounds of wool and start a new business. Um, we'll be offering Navajo grown weaving yarns for sale through our website, rainbowfibercoop.org. 100% of the revenue is going back into the operational expenses for the co-op. You know, right now we're raising money. We um, use grants to cover our expenses. We're on a, you know, we hope to be able to, but, you know, our goal is really to break even and just continue to be able to do the project. Um, if we were ever to make a profit by design, the co-op means that we would pay that out to our members who are the shepherds themselves. The co-op is launching its first collection online in a matter of days, literally. We're putting the finishing touches on everything and hopefully it's going out to our email list on our website on Monday um, with the announcement that it's live. So if you're interested in a, in a project like this, uh, please go to rainbowfibercoop.org. You can scroll to the bottom of the home page or any of the page has the email list subscription form. Sign up, please. Um, we also are still raising money so that you can donate through the website um, and definitely please follow the co-op on Instagram at Rainbow Fiber Co-op. And like I said, follow Nikhil at Navajo Shepherd. They are a phenomenal sheep photographer and storyteller. And really like you'll never see pictures of sheep like what they put out. So if, if you're interested, please check them out too. Um, I just wanted to show you guys some um, pictures from the wool buy um, back in July. 
So this is a sheep flock from one of our producer members in Fort Defiance. Um, they have a flock that's been in their family for generations um, and we bought their wool. Um, most, all of our producers still hand shear, which is a not electric. You can see the blades in the hands of the, um, of the person that's doing that shearing there. It's a very quiet, meditative, it takes a little bit longer, but it's actually pretty beautiful. And it's something that the families will all do together it's a really special time of year. It's important time to connect with the sheep, do health checks. Um, you can see in the picture on the right, there's incredible, beautiful long locks of the sheep. It's a dual coated breed with a coarser outer coat and a softer inner coat. When you blend that all together, it creates a really super strong yarn. I should be lustrous and it's ideally suited to weaving strong things like rugs and blankets. And of course, you know, Navajo weaving is famous around the world for being magnificent. And this is the wool that they used. Um, we went out to, we actually went to all of our producers in person, you know, wool buy, the larger wool buys would have people actually go there and bring the wool there. We actually went out to people um, and we did a wool skirting event with a family. You can see pictured up at the top here on the left. Um, this was one of our producers in copper mine. And it, this was like a collaborative thing because we're learning, this is a new thing for us, you know, we, we, both Nikhil and I have done um, production on a smaller scale, but this was taking things up a step. Um, and so it was very different for us to work with different types of wool coming from different regions um, and to work together to learn like what we're looking for or how we can improve um, and get as much milk quality uh, product generated as possible so that we can get that revenue and then we can make enough money to keep doing this work. Um, <clears throat> we even bought wool stands for the first time. I mean, we were real newbies. Um, my friend Nikhil and Another friend of ours, Jay Begay, who's involved on the board now, um, they've attended and assisted at these large scale wool buys before. So we were really dependent on their knowledge, what equipment to get. We tried to keep it as simple as possible. Um, the scale that's pictured here was a makeshift scale, a vet scale that I had on top of some pallets. Um, so it was pretty, it was a, it was a steep learning curve, but it's just, you know, it's wool. We knew what to do. We're just going to stick to it and get it done. Um, this was an event that we held at uh, Dene Beina's headquarters in Shiprock. Um, Aretta Begay is the director there. It's another organization. I put their Instagram tag there, but you know, they don't post there a lot, but do please follow them as well. They're doing such important work in the Navajo um, community, preserving traditional life ways and celebrating sheep culture. Um, they provide apprenticeships for young people that want to get involved and learn how to weave. It's you know an amazing program. Aretta Begay helped us enormously with coordinating volunteers and just getting all this work done. Um, we spent about five days there skirting wool. We ended up going through 3,200 pounds. Uh, we had some people from the community that were curious and heard what we were doing. It came in and, and uh, talked to us. It was just a really fun atmosphere. Um, we drove all the wool to Mora Valley Spinning Mill in New Mexico. This is Daryl Insinios. This is their spinner. Uh, basically, he is like a superhero of Navajo churro wool and running a mill. He all Most of my pictures of him are blurry because he was just like zipping around like literally a Marvel Comics character. And he's like, he's so passionate about Navajo churro wool. You can see it in his eyes. Just an absolutely amazing person. And produces the best churro yarn out there. Mora is also a nonprofit. So it was important for us to partner with them, not just because of the quality of the yarn we knew we'd produce that Navajo weavers would approve of, but also because we knew that any money that we were spending would also be going to a good cause. Uh, we picked up our first batch of, of yarn uh, back in October. And we took it right out to uh, uh, Eileen Nagel. She's a teacher, a Navajo dye specialist and teacher out in Ganado. And she helped us do this extravaganza, three days of just dying, dying, dying. It was such hard work, but it was so fun. Um, also pictured here is Zephyrin Anderson. He's another one of our board members. Uh, we did a indigo day, a cochineal day, which was amazing. And then some acid dyes. Uh, and this is our beautiful collection that is going online like I said, in just a couple of days. Um, it's so exciting to go from just a conversation and ideas to actually making this live online. Um, so it's really special. Uh, that's our logo. This is just a screen capture from the website. We, we use Shopify, which um, really made it so easy for us to 
get ourselves up and running and in business. And it's just an awesome photograph that Nikhil took of a rainbow sheep. Um, there's a story behind that, and I will post the um, when I get out of this view. I'll post a link in the chat that is the rainbow story told from Nikhil's perspective. It's an important origin story of the sheep in Navajo culture. It's just something I think you guys might be interested to, to learn about. So that's what's happening. Great. Uh, hey, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Kelly. We're just bringing up Mike. He's just having some audio issues. You can unmute if you want, Mike, and give it a try. Yep. I, yeah, yeah like, I got you. Sorry, I missed. I didn't have audio for a little while there. Um, thank you for sharing, Kelly. Um, actually, unfortunately. Oh, we lost him. We lost you, Mike. Hey, maybe I can help out. <laughs> yeah, I'm so okay. it's okay. Thanks, Rebecca. If you want to come up, Rebecca, that'd be great. We're just gonna go to we're gonna go to uh, Sarah next. Thank okay. you very much, Mike. We're gonna have to go. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay, so Kelly, um, high fives. <laughs> Beautiful job. Um, so pleased to see those early photos of the yarns and just encourage everyone to look at the Rainbow Fiber Club website when the yarns go live. Um, all right, so Mike, sorry about the audio. I'm just jumping in to help a little bit. We're gonna tr transfer um, lightning talks to Sarah Kaiser, who's doing very powerful work at the grassroots community scale on fire fuel load reduction. Very honored to work with both of you women um, on so many wonderful occasions. So thank you for being here today. <laughs> All right, Sarah, take it away. <laughs> okay. I hope I, you know, I have a lot to cover. Hopefully I'll get it all done in the amount of time. First of all, I love following Kelly and Marsha. I love both of what you're doing and I'm glad to be on this chat with you. And most importantly, thank you Fiber Shed and Rebecca for all that you do and all that you've created for us producers to have a place to be doing this work and highlight the work we're doing. I'm gonna start out, I have, I'm gonna show my screen but I am gonna start out talking a little bit about my my farm. I can't really call it a ranch because I'm a micro farm that is doing a lot of little things. And then I hope to get into the community grazing cooperatives and talk about collaboration and coming together as communities, which is what Kelly's doing as well with her cooperative and helping build out with Rebecca and a couple other people, the intersectional land stewardship model, which is bringing in indigenous fire ecologists to lead the communities in stewarding their land towards healthy fire ecosystems. It's kind of a collaboration of fire departments, um, community members, fire indigenous fire ecologists, Rebecca, like everybody coming together so that we can heal this land and really know how to steward it and take tend to. Um, There we are. Okay, so my my farm is Wild Oat Hollow. I also have Dandelion Skincare line and I have a fiber line where we make, all of our products are climate beneficial at this point because we do have a carbon farm plan as well. Thank you through Fiber Shed. Um, and I want to talk first of all, just about the changes of the land that I've lived on through carbon farming, through planting. I um, want to appreciate and I've forgotten her name, I think it was Sonia, who talked about the blue elderberry. I love blue elderberry. I have it all over my property and I am a, I, it's a fabulous plant. And if you want cuttings, you can get it for free from me. We can pass elderberry all over. You just stick them in the ground in the wet season. So I just wanted to give you a, a kind of a quick picture of the changes in the land. This is my round barn, which is where I teach classes. When I moved to my property, it looked like it looks on the left and now the, the picture on the right is about two years ago. So now you can barely see, th see the barn through all the growth. This is another place, the other side of the barn. You can see it when we first moved there and you can see the fence line, there's no green, nothing growing. And on the other side, you can see how much growth and there's a whole line of elderberries actually there to create one of the many hedgerows on the property. This is, you can see on the left, when we first moved there, uh, there was a pine tree there and it was nice. You can see the sheep, I think that was, um, pearl. And then how it's changed, the picture on the right, you see, well, first of all, I built a chicken coop, but just to the way edge of the right, you can see the passion flower. One great way to do lots of carbon sequestration is to do green fences. So I have a lot of green fences on the property. I have a lot of passion flower growing. And again, I'm happy to pass that on to anyone who wants it. I have fun. 
Here's a little hedgerow I did of alders and elderberries. You can see when I planted it on the left and then what it looks like now. And that's just two years of growth. Two years of growth and I have about probably 12 feet of difference on the height and at least doubled in the width of the plants. So it's really, really excited to do the to do the work, to do the plantings. I also incorporate the mulberries. I love the mulberries. I incorporate chestnuts. I'm a big fan of bringing chestnuts back onto the land. So I incorporate a lot of edibles into every hedgerow and also try to make sure there's a lot of habitat for wildlife and birds on the plant. So one of the things we do produce is climate beneficial skincare products and fiber. We make, I make goat milk soap from my dairy goats and it also is made from animal fats, either tallow or lard. In Sonoma County alone, Sonoma County, California, where I'm from, we throw away about 10,000 pounds of animal fat every month. Every month, that much goes into the garbage, producers, butchers, all these people have to pay to dispose of that fat. I take it from them, pay them, let them have a secondary income from that rather than an expense, and I make it into goat milk soap. All of my sheep, I have a lot of different breeds. I like to play with breeds. I'm not a one breed girl. I have Romneys, I have Merino, Merino crosses. I really like my BFLs now too. And I kind of cross in a mix of fine fibers to up to Romneys and do different, I show my fleeces and I make yarn and I make roving as well. All the yarns made at either by Markale at a Valley Oak Wool Mill or up Matt and Sarah up at uh, Mendo Wool Mill. So I'm able to use our two local mills depending upon how fine the fiber is, it's, that's who it goes to, but it's always local. I'm very thankful for both of those mills as well. Here's the sum of our animals and my uh, wild child daughter holding one of the goats. We have fiber sheep and dairy goats. We breed for high quality, hardy animals with good feet that know how to move, that can be walked down the road safely, that have good minds, that are easy to handle. Because I like to, I try to sell a lot of my animals into community grazing cooperatives, into people who are just starting with livestock and have animals that know how to be taken care of, that know how to walk down the street safely and with sound minds. So our animals are really, really handleable. So when we teach our classes or we do farm tours, there's lots of sheep to hug. So if you want to hug a sheep, you can come to one of our tours or classes. We, so here's our classes. I teach classes on um, skin, how to make skin care products um, or like pamper me days, salt baths, but mostly on the animal fat based soaps and creams. Our creams are made from animal fat as well. It's made from ghee, dairy goat ghee as well. So I also am blessed to be a part of the Fibershed Carbon Farm cohort number one in Sonoma County. And it's really about building community and collaboration among food and fiber producers. And I wanna thank Fibershed for getting this started. We do land walks, we support each other in the production of hedgerows and our land stewarding projects. We have an annual cutting and seed exchange in which we come together every January and exchange cuttings and seeds so that we can plant hedgerows for free from the free plants we're getting from the rest of the cohort, because it can be prohibitive to, to, to pay for all the plants you're planting. So this is one way that we get to share and we all are working towards or have carbon farm plans and support each other throughout the, all the seasons and help each other with different projects. And the next thing is that the other, one of the other things I do is as a holistic herder, I build community grazing cooperatives all over our county using hooved animals in collaboration to build fire safe communities. Um, the vision of this really is fire fuel load reduction, public safety. It's also about strong, resilient, collaborative communities that take care of each other. I've gone into many neighborhoods to help them develop the cooperatives. They've lived there for 20, 25 years and didn't know their next door neighbor, had never actually spoken to them. As soon as they begin sharing animals, which that's what happened in the neighborhoods, they have a herd or a flirt, which is a mixture of goat and sheep that move around, do fire fuel load reduction, carbon sequestration, um, community building. They can create really micro food sustainable systems in which they all have lamb to feed each family. They get more connected to environmental stewardship using the animals. They develop different relationships to the animals, to the land, and to fire, to understanding all the different pieces that our ecosystem is made up of. And they feel safer and more comfortable on the land and in their home because of how the animals are stewarding that land and making it safe for them to live there. 
We also are working to provide training and job opportunities to young grazers to actually manage some of the herds for some of the large and great, larger grazing cooperatives. We're creating collaborative relationships between large ranchers and rural residential neighborhoods that butt up against ranches so that they can actually share animals with the ranchers as well. We always try to find a way and it doesn't work every single time, but we try to find a way to move these sheep down the road with a, on the hoof. Uh, most, of, many of the neighborhoods I work with do not have the extra money to be buying trucks and trailers. So we walk the sheep down the road. Um, and it, that's why it helps to have sheep that know how to walk down the road. Mine are used to doing it in the Pangrove Grazing Project. But, and it also, the whole community comes out, everybody works together. We move the animals down the road and cars tend to stop and enjoy it as long as you're not on a highway event. So here's a couple of pictures. There's one of our guard dogs and the baby goat. And this is Poppy and her baby Lily right there. Lily's are a mother of her own as well now. But we, re I really get to see, you know, a great connection to the grazing animals, their positive at connection to the land and how it changes communities to be a part of these projects. There's, the there's more moving on the hoof. And on the left was one that did not go very well. This is grazing for fire prevention. So just to give you an idea, the, the fencing is where it was, where it was black was where it was not grazed. You can see where it was brown, where it was grazed and it literally stops fires. It stops fires progression, even if they've made it to the trees. Grazing has a profound effect on really subduing a fire from a dangerous wildfire into a smoldering burn that's healthy for the landscape. The intersectional land stewardship, I think my time's up, but um, it's just, we're coordinating and deploying the recommendation of local tribal leadership on private working landscapes and setting on creating a replicable design for subsequent broad scale adoption by not just by the county initially, but then hopefully in all the fire regions to bring that back that knowledge and to pay the indigenous fire ecologists appropriately so that they can lead us in be going back to really good stewarding of fire ecosystems. And I think there's a couple of pictures. There's some of our land walks that we've done with Clint McKay and Peter Nelson and communities that have lived with fear of fire, communities that have burned from fire in 2017 are coming back, developing grazing cooperatives and working with fire ecologists to really know that they're safe on that land and what a healthy land looks like. And I'll hand that back over to you, Rebecca, because I think I'm out of time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Sarah. That was beautifully done. You covered three major projects so intersectionally, but your life is intersectional, <laughs> spinning many plates with total grace. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, I am taking um, on just a little bit of the transition on the lightning talks for a moment. I'm going to introduce uh, John Bailey, who uh, is the director of the Hoplin Research and Education Center, which um, he will explain more about. But we've had the, the privilege of getting to uh, recently have a producer meetup at ATREC. It's um, an incredibly beautiful, dynamic piece of land in California where uh, sheep uh, breeding and grazing uh, has been part of its history since its beginning. I know it's going through some shifts and changes, but it's also the location where our community has still had access to learning how to become sh sheep shearers. So the shearing school is an incredible offering that um, continues to support our community with vocational training. So thank you, John, for keeping the fort down on fiber um, <laughs> and shearing. Oh, and it looks like he's on the phone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Is that the unmute uh, John on the phone for me? Oh, perfect. Can you can you give us a test? Great. Yep. Can you hear me? Ah, uh, I see how we're doing. Sound great. We can hear you. Hi, John. <laughs> great. Hi, Rebecca. Um, yeah, and Rebecca, thank you so much for helping support the uh, shearing school. We couldn't do it without you. So Fibershed has been instrumental in that, and also in working on developing our own carbon farm plan. Um, which was a fairly intensive process given the 5,400 acres that we've had. So, um, so I will um, go ahead and share my screen now. Um, and then I'm gonna be presenting on, a, uh, on our hedgerow project, 
one of the things that uh, we've been doing at Hopland and that I'm talking about today is uh, installing a native plant hedgerow in some of our grazing lands. And um, there's many reasons to install hedgerows. I've listed quite a few here. Um, there's diverse ecosystem functions that hedgerows support by increasing biodiversity. Um, they also can benefit your livestock operation by forming a, a physical barrier for wind and providing shelter for your animals. Uh, they also improve the soil, uh, increasing the sequestration of soil carbon and reducing erosion. Uh, and this project is actually funded by the uh, California Climate Investments. Um, so they, they have helped us put this in for exactly this purpose of demonstrating it. Um, other benefits to the producer who puts it in is that the material, the plant materials can be a source of cuttings for propagation uh, and also cash crops. There's a diversity of hedgerows that are out there. They're used in many types of agriculture and have been used for centuries. Now, this is a, a really nicely groomed mature hedgerow. Um, there's some good pollinator uh, habitat species in there and it obviously is providing aesthetic value as well. Um, you can also let it go more wild. Uh, it depends on the species that you plant and how well you maintain it, but it really depends on what your needs are, um, where you're putting it on your property. And so a key part when you're designing your hedgerow is figuring out what you're really trying to achieve. You know, are you trying to enhance habitat for certain species? Because there's diverse guides out there around which plant species will do best for certain pollinators or will provide um, food for different mammals or birds. Um, then also you would choose different plants if you wanna have a physical barrier, you're gonna want much larger plants, plant them together. Um, but really you're gonna to have to kind of go through a decision process of what do I want my hedgerow to do? Where do I wanna put it? Uh, and then there's resource constraints. So you really have to make sure you're choosing your plants by your climate zone. Um, you have to have the land available. And in a lot of cases, and like you'll see with ours, we put a fence around it to protect it from sheep. Um, it will take up a little bit of space on your property, but the benefits will far outweigh the cost of that small amount of lost grazing land. Um, it's best if you have irrigation water. Um, even native perennials are gonna do better for the first couple of years with some irrigation. If you're not able to irrigate, you really are gonna to wanna to plant in fall so that you're able to get those plants rooted before the summer heat comes on. There is a cost, uh, both in money and in your labor, and you have to have a bit of expertise. You know, you need to know how to plant your plants correctly so that they have the longest life possible. So once you've uh, figured out what you're trying to achieve um, and you're working within your resource constraints, then you're really gonna to need to look for your location. Um, and then making a planting plan is a key step and make that ahead of time around your, your goals. Um, and you've got to find the plants and that can take a little while as well. So give yourself lead time because California natives aren't in every nursery. Uh, and if you're not in California, look for natives in your area. There's native plant nurseries around the country. Um, there's different ways to prepare the ground. I'm gonna show you the way that we did it, um, which was mostly just digging the plants in, but some people will mow or disc, especially if they've got pernicious weeds. Um, and then when you plant, you don't wanna set your plants in a hole. You want them to be a slightly, slight bit above grade and spaced correctly. Mulching is gonna help you with your um, weed growth. It helps prevent that. And it's also gonna save you water and provide nutrition for the plants. And then irrigation is something you'll, you can work with your nursery on to uh, ensure that you're providing them adequate water, but not too much. Many California natives are sensitive to too much water. And then there's weeds and, and gophers and other things that will come in. So you're gonna have to do some uh, pest control and some plants will die and you're gonna need to replace them. So this is an example of the planting plan that I did just using Excel and the shapes in Excel to lay out the, you know, I, I used the, uh, each square to denote five, four feet so that then I could use the plant spacing to make sure they weren't too far apart or too close. Um, the big green circle is a native oak and we didn't plant underneath that because irrigating on oak roots in the summertime uh, can really shorten their lifespan. Um, and make sure you design around mature plants. You might be tempted to put your plants every two or three feet because it looks pretty at the start, but they're gonna crowd each other out. 
Um, so make sure when you're looking at your plants, you say, okay, that's a 10 foot plant. I'm gonna need five feet of space on either side when that's mature. And you can crowd a little bit. And if you wanna form a hedge, you're gonna to wanna to do that. Uh, and then designing in weed control and irrigation is a key part. So in this instance, we did two drip lines down and then we did sheet mulch. Um, this is gonna be a huge help when you actually go out there on the ground to plant. Um, this is an example of uh, our plants that we put in and um, I find this really helpful and I would suggest it to you as well that you can track your costs, you can make sure you've got the common name, you know, don't necessarily need the scientific name, but sometimes if you're troubleshooting problems, it's helpful to have that. And then the size and the water needs are key. This is our site uh, showing the grazing ground in the background and where we planted the hedgerow in the foreground. Um, we used an auger on our skid steer, which is very helpful, but you can also use a shovel. That, it works perfectly fine. Um, this is when we were installing them in the fall so that they rooted over the winter time. And um, you can see, you know, it, it's hard to see, but we planted each plant crown slightly above the ground surface. We didn't till, you know, till in weed seeds, so we decided not to. But then what we did is we went back through with um, sheet mulch of cardboard and you can see those rings. So we laid the cardboard down and then cut the holes for the plants in that. And then we laid compost on top, both for later nutrition for the plant growth. And also uh, it will help with evapotranspiration, reducing that from your soils. Um, so here are, uh, uh, this is like right after they were planted. And then th we went with all one gallons and a few 3.5 inch uh, pots. And this is after one year of growth. So if you plant your plants right, you give them adequate nutrition and you water them through that first year, you're gonna get significant growth. Um, and you can see there's not many weeds in there. We are getting some turkey mullein coming up, but it's very minimal. And you know, this is after uh, you know, a full year of chances for weeds to grow. Um, luckily it was a drought year, so that helped us. There was less water available for those plants or for the weeds. And then costs, it really depends on you know, where you are, how much you're paying for labor, uh, how much, how, you know, whether you're putting in one gallon pots or five gallon plants. Um, but in general, uh, $2 to $10 per linear foot is, is what's kind of the accepted cost range. Um, and you can see kind of what some of those costs are. You have to buy the plant, you wanna put in irrigation, you're gonna lose a little bit of grazing ground. Um, it can form pest habitat. You can minimize that with plant choice. Uh, like I mentioned, we decided to fence. Uh, which you may have an existing fence you can put them behind, or you may want to fence it uh, for at least the first few years until they get large enough that they can withstand some grazing pressure. And then you will need to figure on a little bit of maintenance. Um, weeding and gophers were the biggest problem for us. There's a lot of uh, materials out there to help you with forming your hedgerow. This one I would really recommend in California. And um, it's put out by CAF. Um, they have a diversity of resources for across the state. Um, Chico State also has a very good section on hedgerows where you can link into different guides. It's an accepted natural resource conservation service practice, which is wonderful because it opens up funding. So the Natural Resource Conservation Service has a few different programs, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, the Conservation Reserve Program, and I can't remember what CREP is right now. <laughs> um, and you know, if you go to your local resource conservation district or your farm service agency, or you go to the California Department of Food and Ag website, um, you can find the, the programs that can help you fund your hedgerow. And again, you know, our hedgerow project is supported by those funds from the uh, CDFA Healthy Soils Program and the climate, uh, California Climate Investments. So with that, I will stop my share. And uh, I don't know if people have uh, questions or whether we're totally out of time. Um, we, I think taking a couple of questions we, is fine. And great, <laughs> I would like to if possible. Let me check. 
Uh, sure. Lexi and Heather may have some questions for you, Rebecca. Just one second. Let's uh, check in there. Lexi or Heather, do you have any questions for the team? I'll bring everybody up. The only one that I saw was someone just asking more about sheet mulching and speaking to that mm -hmm. in terms of setting yeah. up a hedgerow. So um, really what sheet mulching is, is a uh, contiguous layer of material that you lay down on the soil surface to prevent weed seeds from growing up right around your plants. And you can use different materials. So we chose to use a recycled cardboard um, you can use cardboard boxes, but if you do, really make sure you pull the tape out of them. Try to get boxes that are free of dye because some of those can have toxic material that'll leach into your soils. Um, and then if you do pieces of cardboard, you're gonna wanna overlap them by about six to eight inches so that weeds don't grow up sideways through the cracks. Um, you can also, and people do, you can use, um, there's biodegradable rolls of paper fiber that you can use. Um, in, in traditional conventional landscaping, you would use a, um, a plastic mesh. I mean, there's like landscape weed barrier fabrics that are widely used in landscaping, but they break down over time and leave you with plastic particles in your soil. So I don't really recommend those. Um, and then, Putting, and I see a comment here, old wool blankets make great sheet mulch. And I've also heard of people using um, fleece around the individual plant. So if they don't do sheet mulch, they can put a circle around each plant, which, you know, then you can come through and you can weed whack up in the areas further away from your plants and then just do your hand pulling close to the plant. Um, but that, that sheet, the, the fleece right around your plant is gonna provide a, a good barrier for um, preventing weed growth. And, and then you want to put other mulch on top of your sheet mulch because it'll blow away in the wind. It'll get degraded too fast by the sun. And so you can use wood chips. You can use um, compost. Uh, compost is going to provide more nutrition for your soil in the long run. But um, using just wood chips is totally acceptable. And putting down, you know, a good two or three inches is really going to help you with reducing your evapotranspiration from your soil. And a lot of times you can like, find tree companies, they're often, especially in these days where there's huge fuel thinning projects going on, you can find tree companies that will come dump the wood chips on your site for free. Um, so th that's a fairly cheap material to use. Did that answer your question? Yes, that was great. So. There's <laughs> okay. also another, lots of hedgerow questions and curiosities. Does anyone find that hedgerows near the perimeter fencing enables predators? And that could be to anyone. We haven't had that experience personally, but the, the fence is on the exterior of our hedgerow and it's keeping the predators out from the whole field. So if you put it on the outside of your fence, you might create shelter for some of those predators to hide next to your fence, but I've, I haven't seen that myself. But it really does seem to form good habitat for ground squirrels and gophers. Those are the trickiest ones. Well, and lots of, I've found in my hedgerows, lots of songbird habitat and songbird safe habitat from hawks. So you, you're creating more kind of beneficial habitat than I've found any predator habitat. Yeah, and for pollinators as well. I mean, especially if you're choosing native plants, they evolved with the, with the pollinators around here. So they're gonna be better aligned with the life cycle of the pollinators and provide appropriate nutrition at the right times of year. Marsha, did you have something that you wanted to add? Um, no, we haven't we haven't done multi-species hedgerows yet. So I'm really uh, just soaking up the information for our plans for the coming year. And Marcia, I definitely have some cuttings for you if you just I want, want them. I definitely I'll want bring them. you a bunch because I, I, I know I have a lot of plants that do all your place too. Yeah. Some carbon. Um, and one other thing I'll I'll mention is oh sorry, Rebecca. Oh no, go ahead. <laughs> um in our hedgerow, we really tried to demonstrate a diversity of species. And so I set up a little bit more complicated irrigation system with a more water and a less water uh, circuit, and then um, put in some areas that are more riparian species, some that are more chaparral, 
some that are really for physical barrier and then some that are dye plants as well. So um, we'll be doing field days this upcoming year pending COVID and all um, where we can kind of show you what the different plants look like. And it's, it's a bit of a compromise. I mean, it's not optimized exactly for our landscape because we did try to shoehorn a bunch in there for the demonstration value. Thank you, John. And thank you everyone for taking the time for the lightning talks. I, they are fast and brief and the breadth of your work is deep. So thank you for taking part in a, a technically shallow conversation for very powerful work. <laughs> um, but we will you know, consistently keep returning to these subjects. So have a beautiful rest of your day.